From Fox 8 Sports, this is the Overtime Podcast. From the Fox 8 Studios in New Orleans is the Fox 8 Overtime Podcast. I'm Vasilios. That is Sean Fazan. Remember to like, subscribe, rate, and review. You can find us wherever you listen to and watch your podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit the bell notification button. You get an update every time we upload a new episode of the podcast. Sean, how was your weekend? Uh, first weekend, at least for a little while longer, without Saints football. I had a fantastic weekend. Fantastic weekend. But before I go into that, still, I wanted to harp on this for a second. Um, if you're watching this video and you watch this video regularly and you're not a subscriber, please subscribe, like, share. Um, just helps with the algorithm and yep. uh, try to get some of those numbers up. Uh, we've gotten a great response from a very active uh, base, if you will, for people that seem to come to us quite a bit, but trying to get some of those numbers up. So if you were watching this video and you are a regular watcher or a semi-regular watcher, just do us a favor, click like, share, hit that subscribe button, be mm-hmm. all good. Um, you were asking me about my weekend. I had a fantastic weekend. I hope you guys did too. I hope you didn't let this nonsense in black and gold ruin uh, <laughs> what was a fantastic weekend because I can promise you it did not ruin mine. I went to dinner Saturday night at nice. one of the city's uh, finest establishments downtown. And then Sunday, I watched football all day. And I had <laughs> a blast doing so. And I just got to tell you, watching those games, the games we were able to watch, by Sunday night, I didn't feel quite as bad about the Saints. Not because the Saints all of a sudden are good or bad or any better or worse. It's just the NFL is so mediocre this year. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Like, the media, the, the mediocre play, the mediocrity is everywhere. The NFC South especially. I watched that Atlanta-Tampa Bay game. Ugh. Just an ugly game. I mean, I've, what a, maybe a handful of good teams right now in the NFL, mm-hmm. your guys being one of them. The Chiefs, Eagles. I guess we'll see what happens with San Francisco tonight. But... It's it's a three or four really good teams, and then the rest are either mediocre or bad. So the Saints fall <laughs> right in that middle rut there, right in that middle of the pack uh, version as they uh, get closer and closer to week eight here in the NFL. In a time and place where it certainly feels like the urgency is uh, on fire. It, it just it has to, yeah. things have to turn soon, very soon. And hopefully that happens this weekend. So one of the things that we saw, obviously, the since the Saints played on Thursday, we got more of the all 22 a lot sooner. And we had a longer period of time to look at it. And that included former quarterback JT O'Sullivan, who studied the offensive, uh, the offensive snaps throughout the game. Mm hmm. What did you take away from his film study there? Well, first off, this is the film breakdown that um, everyone seems to be talking about. I had a, Quite a few text messages sending me the link. I, I actually watch his videos quite a bit because I, I'm a film study guy, and, and there are certain things when it comes to my own version of film study that I don't feel quite as confident in, so I watch his, and there's another guy I watch uh, that helps me in particular when it comes to identifying protections. That's just the area where I feel like I need to learn the most. But nonetheless, um, Jeff Duncan wrote a column about it. Um, if you don't, y'all don't know, J.T. O'Sullivan was a draft pick of this team way back in the early 2000s, way back in the... Jim Hazlitt years. Deuce McAllister, our guy, uh, was a teammate of his. So this guy's got some skins on the wall in terms of he was in the league for quite some time. I know he had a few starts with San Francisco. I want to mm-hmm. say like Detroit. He bounced around quite a bit. Never really did anything. Just Still made it to his, the actual, his actual playing career. But enough to do a film study. And sometimes they Absolutely. say backup quarterbacks are the best at pointing out film studies because they, they have a tendency to, to really lock in on the details. So, but... That's just the backstory on him, and, and I, so I, I took it serious, and I, and I certainly um, appreciated what he did because it was pretty in-depth, pretty thorough. I think it was like 40-minute breakdown. <laughs> um, but here's what it really did for me watching it. I thought it brilliantly illustrated that this truly is offensively an equal opportunity problem. And that's not just being diplomatic. Oh, we all got to do better. No, it is the truth. It is the truth from offensive coordinator to quarterback to offensive line, maybe not necessarily in this game, but offensive line certainly had their issues, Mm -hmm. to wide receivers, to running backs. Everyone. There is no one on offense right now, no group on offense right now playing to the capability that they're able to play. What it also showed to me was every quarterback has his best and his worst performance and is 
crazy as it is to say because the backlash was so swift and so hard after because they lost. I think Cars came in the same game, at least when it came to best and worst in a Saints uniform because he was awful. I mean, awful the first two and a half quarters. It felt that way when you were watching it. It felt that way when he when you went back and watched the tape. I mean, he missed. It felt three, that way when we he did missed, our pot on Friday. On Friday, he missed three. He had three huge misses, and two were probably touchdowns. But they go no huddle. They go tempo. He rallies and almost, you know, I, I, I thought about this today. If if they make the catch, and they somehow pull off that comeback, man, it's a, such a different tune surrounding Derek Carr. And that, that's just the line when it comes to winning and losing, hero goat, and not the goat, the, the new age goat, the old school goat, where mm. the, uh, the hero versus the goat. Um, and look, JT O'Sullivan broke down everything. And so a lot of, because that game was on Thursday, it was the only game on the air, because it was national TV, you, you didn't just get the national TV reaction. You got the entire next day sports cycle reaction. Because yep. Thursday, you know, you don't really get into NFL, true NFL stuff until like, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for the Sunday games. But that Thursday night game, that that's talked about a lot uh, the following day. So Derek Carr certainly had his. And here's the deal. There's a lot. Actual football-wise, like I said, it was his cold and as hot as you can get just in terms of how bad to how good uh, in a single game as you can you can get but there are so many other layers because there was the sideline outburst issue there was the issue with Chris Olave there was Mike Thomas jumping in social media explaining the play kind of defending Olave politely for Mike Thomas politely but clearly I guess in his mind setting the record straight on that play. We've already mm. discussed that play and uh, JT kind of discussed that play as well. Like why are you throw why are you getting mad if he's throwing it out of bounds? Turns out he was not throwing it to Olave. He was kind of mad at the route Olave ran, the way he ran it, and he kind of just aborted the play and, and, and threw the ball out of bounds. He might have had Taysom, but he should have went back to the other side of the field. That's what Michael Thomas was certainly pointing out. It led to a couple blow ups. There's been a few blow ups. Um just being around the team today, seeing his reaction right after the game, how he kind of, he basically was like, I got to chill. Mm-hmm. And we he's been called out quite a bit. This is a bold proclamation, bold prediction. I don't think we see another sideline outburst the rest of the season from Derek Carr. I don't think we see it. Um, I Somebody must have got to him and said, that's a bad look, dude. It really is a bad look. Because you just, you can't be that guy constantly yelling, constantly you know, screaming. You know, uh, I'm trying to think of quarterbacks that had a reputation for that. Maybe like, wasn't like Philip Rivers like that back in the day? Yeah. I remember the old school blow ups between Chris Carter and Dante Culpepper back in the day. But for the most part, you'll have frustration on the sideline and sometimes you'll have a back and forth. But back to back weeks, you got to keep your emotions in check and you got to really just control yourself. And I think certainly he sounded like a guy that understood that right after the game. Now you get to the practice week. You got to have the weekend to kind of let loose, wash it out, and then hopefully by the practice week, everything is fine in terms of your work environment. But I wanted to touch on this because I went through, you know how it is on on YouTube. You kind of get get on a topic, and there's a few. And Derek Carr was a topic of conversation. And I must be honest, the national media was it was not good. And there was one topic that came up that he was getting criticized pretty hard, basically like saying like he's the type that it's never his fault after a game. I got to push back a little bit on that because I can just, I have not dealt with him nearly as much as any of the guys covering him in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe this was a thing, but I do definitely recall after week one, the win against Tennessee, he immediately said how stupid it was that interception he threw to, I don't know what it was. It was a throw. It was a bad throw, bad decision. He immediately kind of fell on the sword for it. The, Carolina game said the same thing and he even said I was playing way too fast in the first half basically acknowledging where his shortcomings were I, I don't think can he I, just runs out and blames everybody and it's never can I push back fault. on that go ahead quick, please do because it's easy to easier to fall on the sword when you get the dub fair enough so I mean I I, I haven't seen enough of it like like you I haven't seen a big enough sample size to really make that judgment but it is easier to fall on the sword after a dub yeah absolutely um and I guess 
what I'm trying to say is I'm not necessarily there to like to to basically say he's a bad teammate yet. I'm not, I'm, no. I'm, I'm not I'm not there yet because no. it, it was kind of what these these people were hinting at, and this is people with bigger platforms than us and, and on much more recognizable uh, brands uh, in terms of national uh, scope uh, that than we have. Um, so it's something I'm watching, but I. I, don't, I just don't think you're going to have any more blow-ups. Hopefully, like, Derek Carr and Michael Thomas and Chris Olave especially and Rashid Jaheed, they just need to get together and just, all right, let's just talk. Let's just talk and let's just – because, look, like it or not, they're all they're all in this together, mm-hmm. and they're all going to be together this year. So uh, they got to figure out a way uh, to get that going. I, I just thought it was interesting how it all broke it all down, and when you're losing – Everything seems to be magnified, and when you're losing on national TV and you have outbursts, it gets magnified tenfold. And I honestly think everyone deserves a piece of the blame here. I mean, that's Absolutely. not being diplomatic. That's just being truthful because if you watch everything from play designers issues, play calling, there's issues from route running, there's issues from running backs not missing, not, not picking up protection, there's issues. There's been offensive line issues. There's quarterbacks missing throws, being inaccurate. I mean, defense didn't play their best game on Thursday. Defense didn't play their best game, so. It was a short week as well. I'd be very curious how they respond this week. I really am because um, uh, that that film breakdown really, like, it was like, whoa, this is this is an eye-opener here. So, mm. I, I mean, what's your take on Derek Carr, though? Do, do, do you pick up on a vibe like he's always blaming somebody else? I haven't gotten that vibe yet this season. I, I don't I remember. Feel, I don't know many other times. I, I didn't. I didn't follow Derek Carr press conferences before. I this. didn't either. And but I mean, like I've never gotten the the idea that he's a bad teammate. Right. But me neither. I, I feel like maybe maybe with enough losing, maybe that changes. Who knows? But like I, I I haven't gotten that vibe, and I certainly don't think he's a bad teammate as of right now. Yeah. And and look, everybody was all on cloud nine a couple weeks ago when they defeated uh, the Patriots thirty four to nothing. And all it takes <laughs> is one win. All it really takes is one win to kind of yep. get things back on track. So I just want to put that out there just in terms of that JT O'Sullivan breakdown because it was too big and it was too active amongst Saints media and fan and probably, I don't know what the organization looked at it, but just those type of circles. So I just want to get that out there. All right, and you kind of alluded to it earlier. You went to practice today. Uh, you stayed, stuck around for the, uh, for the pressers. What was the energy like over there? Because, I mean, I, I, when I was watching Eric McCoy earlier, he seemed to really try to hammer the point home that everybody's all good right now and there's no animosity in the locker room. What did you see? About yeah, that? well, first off, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if it was an official practice. I went to the press conference today. which So um, it definitely was a deliberate tone, a, like, I guess serious tone, not not tense, but you know, obviously understanding the situation. They weren't all cutting up, joking and laughing. And, yeah, the, and we're three and, and four. Tone. Yeah, definitely. Um, I I think the mini break was good, and hopefully, because right now I just think things are too emotional around there. I mean, after the game, during the game, after the game, crowds booing. Like sometimes it gets so emotional, it's hard to function. So hopefully that break. And you got a little bit of break the the week to week monotony. You were able to just detach, get some things, uh, get, get your mind right. It sounded like today was a like meeting of the minds. Everybody get here, team meeting type, mm-hmm. and have open and honest conversations, and not like in a rah rah. We got to do better. It's if it doesn't get fixed, there's going to be some people losing their jobs because I. I said in the last pod, if changes are not made and they just keep doing the whole let's try harder, I think you're going to win some games, but you're going to be relevant enough, but you're probably going to be around you know, mediocre, eight wins, nine wins, stay around 500, which might be good enough to win the NFC South. If that's good enough for them, so be it. Dennis Allen said no changes are being made. He said if they are being made, he will let us know. He wasn't flipping about it, but in the same breath, he was talking about no more growing pains. Mm. Um, McCoy was like, no more figuring it out what the problem is. We've done enough of that. We've got to now find the solution. A lot of harping on practice ha- habits. A lot of harping on, you know, working together. It's not like quarterback and receiver after practice, the way they meet, the way they prepare. I don't know if this is like the last the last bit 
I think I've said that a couple times. Maybe this is the last line in the sand. I know they got the the reprieve with the, the with the Patriots game a couple weeks ago. You got to buy in a couple weeks after this. Um, I don't know. Uh, and look, I was curious how they would process their offensive effort against Jacksonville. Are they going to harp on the bat, or do they are they going to harp on the, the the finish that they had? Sounds like a little bit of both, which mm. is probably what you want to do. You know, we got to get better. Dennis Allen said, we need results. We need results. Um, I know there's a there's a feeling sometimes in the fan base with Dennis Allen that he, maybe he's a little bit tone deaf. Didn't sound that way today. Sounded like he got the urgency of the situation, but I was a little surprised that, I, you know what, I wasn't surprised. I was not surprised they didn't make any changes. But I just wonder how cl- how much closer he is getting to making a change, whether it be something as simple as a punter. Mm-hmm. Or play caller, or whatever the case may be. Another benching. Uh, another benching. Um, they did say a few times they feel like they're close. I don't know. What is that? I mean, every team's close in the NFL. Yeah. Um, but offensively, it's got to come together. So I wish I had something a little more definitive in terms of where I feel like this team is going, how I feel like this team currently is. But the truth of the matter is when you're three and four, you're coming off a loss like that, and you're going into another very serious, a very important week. Um, they want to say the right things. They want to present the right message. But it's like, what, what, what can they really say right now that's going to please anyone? And what can Dennis Allen do right now short of firing his offensive coordinator or a, another major benching that was going to get anybody happy? And I, even then it probably wouldn't be. So um, I just think you got to let this thing play out you gotta work this week i'm gonna go out there wednesday to see the kind of the vibe because sometimes you know outside there can be a lot of chatter and this and that negativity but you go to a practice it's like all right back to the work week and it's like they just get into that grind mode so i'm gonna see when wednesday rolls around but uh was definitely was an interesting stretch of a few days when you talk about the thursday loss the film breakdown and then just sort of the whole uh vibe around saints camp but we'll see look i I'll say it again, as bad as it is, and I hate going back to this. I really do because I'm, I'm, I am not trying to be positive. The truth is they are only one game back out of first place. Mm-hmm. Somehow. Some and way. both of the I still don't know how they lost Tampa Bay. But <laughs> both of those teams that are ahead of them are, are not good. Are not good. Now, you can say the same thing about the Saints. Probably all average. But nonetheless, as they say, it is what it is. You still got to play this thing through, and you got to play this thing thing through at least for one more week, uh, as as they were last week with the same coaching staff, the same players, and the same things uh, to keep rolling. C's get degrees, and average makes <laughs> the playoffs, Sean. So, any last thoughts as we head into Colts week? Nothing really. Just uh, there's not really you can say or do. You just gotta see what happens on Sunday. Hopefully, have a good week, and hopefully, they get back to. Back to their winning ways and get the four and four. We'll see. All right. Saints take on the Colts this weekend. And of course, we're gonna have two more pods to you by the time we get to Sunday. For Sean Fazan, I'm Vasilius. We'll get to, we'll catch you guys next time.